So yeah, what I want to talk about today is generalizing scientific machine learning through differentiable simulation. And I want to take you through a journey of the many ways in which the scientific machine learning tools are being used, mostly as a way to kind of like pique your curiosity and how to come up with your, your own ways to be able to put spins on the methods and your own ways to be able to put spins on how to put this into use, right? Because I think that the main thing is here, scientific machine learning is somewhat new, though we are seeing that it's already kind of crossed the chasm and is being used in, you know, in a lot of like larger scale applications. And so it's something that you can kind of start to, to use today. So first of all, what is scientific machine learning, right? So scientific machine learning, I think, is at, at its general, at its most general form. It's just this idea, right? It's this idea that instead of just using data for your machine learning, you can use scientific knowledge as well, right? You know, if you, if you think about it, like there's a, there, you know, your, your machine learning or whatever your model is, is a, it's a beaker where if you put in, if you pour enough information into it, you'll get a good enough prediction, right? And now the, the question is, where does this information come from, right? Um, the information can come from data, right? If you're Google and you have 3.4 you know, billion rows of, of data on, you know, on some kind of you know, a language or something, then you can use that information to train a large neural network and get good enough predictions, right? If you have enough data, then you can just make machine learning work. That's what we've seen in the 2010s. But the other thing that has a lot of information is models, right? So for example, if I was to ask you, what is the, you know, what is the single, you know, billions of row data set that tells you that, that general relativity is true, you might not be able to point to a great one, right? You know, it might not be able to point to a great one that is, shows you that in the whole entire general sense, general relativity is true. But you might know that there's, hey, the, the, you know, it's been replicated. The results in, in the idea of general relativity has been shown in many, many different experiments. So those equations themselves are a form of knowledge, right? You can almost think about these scientific equations, these, these mathematical laws that we know are essentially a compressed form of data that comes from many different experiments. And so from that sense, well, why not make use of that information of that data equivalently to how we make use of data for model or, you know, this big data that we train in machine learning, right? This is the general idea then behind scientific machine learning, that we want to be able to come up with methods that are able to use scientific prior knowledge just as much as we use, uh, as, as much as we use scientific data, right? And there's a lot of reasons for this, right? You know, maybe it's very easy to come up with, you know, data from social media, but when you're doing astrophysics, you can't just get, you know, if you, you can't just be like, well, let's just get 30 billion hours of the telescope data. You're, no, that's infeasible, right? So you, what, you need, you, what you need is to be able to use all pieces of knowledge that you have, and that's really what scientific machine learning is geared towards. And I'm going to have a, I'm going to go through many different methods here throughout this, but my, my core point is going to be that differential simulation is hard. Right, and I'll mention what differential simulation is, uh, but it's worth developing a lot more time in and because the methods in, in this kind of thrust of scientific machine learning seem to be getting a lot of really nice results, but they're, com they're not complete. You know, there's a lot of things that are useful today, but there's a lot of improvements that are still ongoing. So what I, uh, the, 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 first, you know, the first type of method I want to talk about here are the universe, just putting universal approximators in differential equations which has been commonly referred to then as universal differential equations, where the idea is you take this, this machine learning object, you know, and I'll describe it can be a neural network, though there's some examples that where it won't be a neural network. Um, you take some kind of uh, universal approximator function, and you use that to be able to cover parts of a model that you don't know how to model, right? So what do I mean by a universal approximator type object? What I mean is just any object that is able to approximate a full function space from R and RM. That's still a bit mathematical. So, so like a very concrete way of saying it is, you know, these types of objects are objects where for any function in its given class, you can find parameters that make this act epsilon close to whatever function you want it, right? So let's say you have, you know, let's say, let's say you have the function that is, uh, you know, doing, doing some wonky thing like this, right? You know, you can think about this as, you know, at, this is f of x equals y, you know, X goes in, uh, Y goes out, right? This is a R1 to R1 function, right? And there's and there's theorems out here called universal approximation theorems, you know, uh, universal approximation theorem, which basically says, you know, uh, there is a big enough, uh, there is a big enough neural network such that you know, n n of theta 
of x equals y plus some epsilon for all, you know, x dot 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 dot, you know, for some theta, right? So what, what, do I, what do I mean by this? What I mean is that, you know, so this is like a very high level way of saying it, right? There's a, you know, you can, stu you can look at it in a very much more concrete way and say well, over what function spaces, et cetera, et cetera. That's for your math courses to do. The, 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 the key idea, though, is that, you know, the, uh, for the, there is a large enough neural network. So if you choose, you know, big enough layers and enough layers and all this kind of stuff, that you get enough weights of your, you get enough, a big enough neural network that there, there's a big enough weight vector such that it will be able to be epsilon close, you know, or I, I guess I should say uh, this my, minus y is less than epsilon, right? So I said it'll be able to be epsilon close over your whole uh, your whole domain that you care about, right? So what this means is that you know big enough neural networks can approximate everything, right? That's like the the key idea. But and so what we want to do then is we want to use that property that big neural networks can approximate everything to be able to approximate functions that we don't know how to model. So let's say we have a you know a model of you know how rabbits and wolves work. You know you have x prime equals you know you get. If you leave bunnies alone, you get exponentially many bunnies. If you leave wolves alone, you get exponential decrease in your amount of wolves. And you put uh, bunnies and wolves in the same room. And my mother never told me exactly what happens when you, when you put bunnies and wolves together. And so you say, oh, we got, a, we got a missing part of our model. But we do know that they interact probably. Because my data says there's something much more complicated than bunnies go up and wolves go down. So what do I, what do, I do to learn this, this interaction, right? And this is the, the core idea behind the universal uh, differential equation, which then, you know, there, uh, there's been some discussion already on, you know, the, the exact uh, details of, of this. I want to kind of dig into this example a bit more, uh, first by using a different example and then by actually going into some code here to kind of describe this idea in a more accessible way. So I really like one of the other examples that we did here early on during the pandemic, because here, for example, is this is this problem that we looked at where you say, okay, you know, let's um, let let's uh, try to you know, it's 21 days worth of pandemic information. You know, here here's uh, information about infected, recover, and people people have been infected by COVID-19. You train a, a machine learning model, and you say, well, let's extrapolate from 21 days worth of data what the future of the pandemic is going to be like, right? And you get this beautiful prediction from you know 21 day, data points of machine learning of it telling you absolutely nothing, right? And the, this is actually what you should expect, right? You know, you always hear like neural networks, you know, they, they need, require a lot of data, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just one instantiation of that, right? So this is a case where the model is U prime equals a neural network, right? And you can interpret this as U prime, I want to find what, a differential equation that fits the data, and it can be any possible function. And from the class of any possible functions, something that looks kind of somewhat like a line fits the data and then you you push that forwards and you know there's there, the machine learning has done nothing wrong there there's just not enough information for it to be able to make a accurate prediction of what's going to happen in the future now when you first see this example you kind of laugh at it and you scoff at it and you just go well how come the machine learning doesn't know that like you know with a, a, a when you have a pandemic you have exponential growth at the beginning right you're always going to have at least one peak to start like there's all this information that you come to this and you're like, oh, why doesn't the machine neural network know that, right? And the reason why it doesn't know that is because we have stated so far, you know, you, when we say U prime, you know, U prime equals neural network of U, right? We are saying that this is a ODE, U prime equals F, to, uh, uh, F of U for any possible F, right? You know, that's this, this, that's this thing. So it chose an F out of the space of any possible F and it accidentally chose a bad one. And you can choose different, you know, initializations until it fits well. But, you know, what's, what's a way that makes this work more reliably, right? And this is where you can start to say, well, let's just bring in prior knowledge that we know. I mean, so during the pandemic, you probably heard about SAR type models 20,000 times until you never want to hear one again. Well, here's one that you've, you're hearing post-pandemic. Uh, um, but the, the core idea that, that you get from this is, is actually quite a few things, right? So here, this is an SEIRD model, right? So susceptible individuals become exposed, exposed individuals become infected, infected individuals uh, recover or they die, right? And so what happens? Well, it's what happens, right? Um, and, and so what happens in, the, in this type of model, though, is a few things happen, right? 
So one of the things that, that you recover, right, which you can always do in, in other sci scientific models, is you make use of heterogeneous data, right? So one of the issues with this kind of pure machine learning setup is we're just saying, hey, I believe my time series has all the information. Let's extrapolate forward. But the time series doesn't have all this information, right? Like, you know, from, from a pandemic, there's information that you have, like, oh, what is the percentage of people who die, uh, who die versus recover? What is the percentage of people who get hospitalized? You know, all this other information actually can give you approximate parameter values. So parameter values might not be correct, but they can put you in like a relative range, right? And so you can come up with a model that's decent or good enough. And then, but the, the, the core idea of what's difficult about this kind of model is, for example, with uh, uh, SEIRD, um, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you model how people become exposed to COVID-19, right? That was a big effect, difference in effect between if someone was wearing a mask because they're, you know, in the eastern coast of the United States, or if they were in Sweden, there was no lockdown at all. And how do you encode all of that information in a simple polynomial equation of all the different ways that, you know, the political struggles and everything that happened? I have absolutely no idea. So I make that be a neural network, right? And so you, you basically what I've done here is I said, I have a decent enough model and, uh, and let's, let's just use this as a basis. And what you can see is that just from that amount of information, it's able to predict about 20 days into the future whereas just using the pure neural network did not. And so you can think about this as like, yo, the, the, I think that there's two completely different ways to kind of think about this phenomenon. In one sense, you can think about it as, I've imposed some uh, prior known structure, I've imposed some information that I know, and it's been able to make use of that to be able to, um, to, be able to extrapolate well, right? And at a high level, that seems to make sense, right? I think at a more concrete level, if you think about it in terms of this, you know, universal approximation theorem, right? What I've done is I've actually defined, th this is essentially a new universal approximator, right? It's a universal approximator of functions that have certain properties. Now, what are some of these properties, right? Well, if you look at the first line there, so, so let's assume that in this case, I, that I'm going to replace that, that unknown portion with the neural network, but I'm going to just absolute value what comes out of this neural network, right? Uh, so that absolute value on a neural network means that it's the neural network portion is a universal approximator of positive functions, right? It's from R to R plus at that point. And so it's a universal approximator of positive functions. And so if I do that, then if you look at S, S is always negative. So therefore, well, therefore there are a few things that are going to happen here. Therefore you have a exponent, you're going to have an exponential growth at the beginning of this, of this model. And then you're going to have that S uh, starts dropping off. And so you can actually then prove, you know, over the space of all possible functions here that you have a peak within this model, right? You, and there's, uh, there's a lot of nice properties that you can start to prove here, right? So, so in, in a sense, you can say, well, instead of this just being a, you, you know, the, instead of this being useful because, oh, it has epidemic information, therefore it's nudged in the right direction, another way to understand why this works out is that I have defined a ma machine learning object, a new, you know, this kind of machine learning object that has the property that you have exponential growth to when you start, and you have a single peak, and you have this, and you have this, and you have, and so I basically just you know, the model might not be correct, but it is a machine learning type of model that has a lot of the right features that you would expect for function to be in. So, you know, you, you can think about it as, um, you know, there, there is the, the, the if you let, uh, you know, if you let, uh, you know, if you let, uh, you know, capital S be the set of all, all, all functions, right? You know, another way of thinking about this is that you have the UDE, you know, which is, you know, which is equal to uh, some, uh, some functions with the right structure. And this is a strict subset here, right? You know, that's a, you know, the, the, the functions, the functions that have a single peak that then, you know, the, 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 the whole, the whole story that we've encoded there is a subset of all of our functions. And so if we pick a function from there and, and our assumptions are correct, if our, if our prior knowledge is correct, then we should be able to, on average, choose a function randomly out of that set that is fit, both fitting our data and satisfying these properties, and it should strictly do better, right? 
And that's why, you know, in the, in the first case, oh, you don't get something that has exponential growth at the beginning, even though we all know that a pandemic should have exponential growth, right? Well, it shouldn't be a surprise that this one chooses a function that has an exponential regime because that's actually required by the way that we've defined this new machine learning model, right? So this is, this is one way to kind of start thinking about it. Now, the next step is actually kind of a, a, a fun key right here, which is where you say, okay, you know, we, we have a, there, there, you know, the interesting thing about doing this kind of model is that the moment that you've trained this neural network, you actually have a representation of what you did not know how to model, right? You know, so when, once you have this, uh, when, once you have this kind of form where you say, you know, U prime equals, uh, I'm not sure why there's so much uh, wet chalk over there. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's just like pooled water down there. So, um, so w once you have this form that's like, you know, U prime equals, you know, uh, U prime equals some f of u that you know is known. And it doesn't have to be additive, by the way, but you have this uh, uh, neural network that is, you know, this unknown, right? Once, you, once you've trained this piece, the, the interesting thing about, uh, about, about this kind of technique is that, you know, once, you, once you've trained this piece, you now have a, a computational representation for the thing that you didn't know, right? You don't necessarily at that point, you know, know what the equations are. But you you can give it values and it gives you values back of oh this is this is how the thing that you didn't know how to model kind of works right and so you could do all sorts of analyses with it right so uh, you can do you can do things like you know well if you have explainable machine learning you can ask it questions you can do global sensitivity analysis global analysis one of the ones that we like to do is uh, uh, is things like sparse regression right because we can say well we've learned this we've basically now trained a neural network in a in a form that captures all the properties, that encodes all the prior known knowledge that we have. And with all this prior known knowledge, this neural network has pulled something out from the function space that we want to know. But now with, with respect to that, what did it actually learn? You know, what is, a, what is the simplest form of what it can learn, of what it learned, right? So, so then we can use a symbolic regression algorithm, which I'm not gonna go into the details of the different symbolic regression algorithms, but we used one of them. Uh, this one was sequential thresholding these squares. Um, and it pulls out a, a, a equation, right? Now, there's two things that are kind of interesting about doing this, right? One thing is that since you actually have this neural network with a lot of structure with it, a lot of times what you find from that neural network uh, sparsification is actually something that's mechanistically interesting, right? So for example, when, for this example, the neural network was allowed to be a function of S, I, and, uh, and D. If you look at the equation that, that we get from the sparse regression, it's a function of S and I, which means that the predictor, in order to make a good prediction, it did not have to have uh, D involved in the, uh, in the exposure equation at all, which makes sense, right? If you think about mechanistically, people who are already dead are not exposing people to COVID-19, right? And that, that prediction, you know, that mechanistic prediction can be read out just from the sparsification of the neural network in this example. Right, because if it was actually a predictor in there, it would show up in the equations. Now, you can't always. I wouldn't always take uh, the the. I would always take the symbolic regression results with a kind of a grain of salt. Um, I'll go into to some details about why later. But essentially, this can this can be something that can be helpful for your scientific cause. So you know, if you're trying if you're trying to do something like answer a question of, well, I have a bunch of chemical reactions that I've written down, uh, but something seems wrong with my model. I mean, who here has done, who has written a code where you go, oh, something seems wrong with my model and then you have to play with it for months on end until you get your model correct, right? Well, yeah, so, if, wow, that's actually a smaller group than I thought. I thought everyone was spending like, you know, four months trying to fix their model. It means that some of you might not be modeling. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as you do this process, right, you know, uh, what, hap what happens when you, when you think your model's incorrect, what you do is you go to the scientific literature and you say, okay, of these 7,000 papers, what, what thing did I not, not understand did I not put in my model, right? Well, the nice thing about the UDE approach is it spits out a bunch of, it says these are the potential terms. Now, maybe not all those terms are correct, but all those terms together does give you something that, that predicts correctly. And so you can start to say, well, what subset of those actually make mechanistic sense? And you, and you can use that to start to go back to the literature and say, well, this tells me that there's an interaction between infected and, and, and uh, you know, in, infected and susceptible individuals. Do I expect that, right? You know, for, in chemical reaction neural networks, it would say, oh, there's an interaction between these two chemicals according to this equation. Do I expect that? 
you might go back and find some like Russian in the 1980, 1985 or something that said, oh, this chemical reaction exists. How does nobody know about this, right? It has never been in the models before. But this is something that will kind of give you, turns this, this kind of wild modeling process into something, from something that is a guess and check into something that can be a bit more multiple choice. You know, here are your choices. Go find out which ones make sense. And I think that that's really, you know, so I kind of think about it more in terms of like helping the modeling process rather than like completely automating it. But, um, you know, there's different takes on that. But the other thing is that it actually generally improves the generalizability. This is something that we don't quite know all the details as to why. If you if you want to ask a question, I could give you like a short uh, proof sketch that we have, but it's not, it's still very sketchy. So I don't, um, but what we, we, what we can say that uh, empirically we see over and over and over that the sparsified form does generalize better than, than keep leaving the neural network back in there. So it is an interesting kind of piece. And, and so, you know, I, I, you know, if you want to kind of go into some details, I, I would say that there is a, there's a paper that we did, uh, well, this, this thing that we did with uh, Sandia on uh, model form epistemic uncertainty, where what we did was we just kind of start played around with th these ideas over and over and over in different cases, where you can say, you know, if, if you look at this UDE, there's, uh, you know, the, I, I had some neural network in there, but what if I did more? What if I captured more with the neural network, less with the neural network, more data, less data? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just point out that this, this uh, 2022 manuscript that we did uh, as part of Sandia really looked into this idea in detail. And, I, and, I, and what, what its major conclusion is, is really just this, this high level, you know, this high level diagram, which is that, you know, if, if, you, if you put it into some, you know, metric or something, you know, the more, you, the more model that you have inside of your thing that is correct, the less data that you need. And the more, the less model that you have that's correct, the more data you need. So I can't necessarily tell you with these techniques, like how many data points you need, because it's still kind of fairly loosely defined. Uh, but what we were able to show is that, you know, as you, as you grow the amount of prior model that you have, and as you shrink the amount of prior knowledge you have, that does change the amount of data that's required to hit the same accuracy and predictions as you'd expect. So the more prior, the more correct prior knowledge, the less data you need. And so that's what some of these uh, uh, things I'm showing on the bottom right, uh, they, they discuss. Um, so, you know, but I, I think that the real takeaway then is that the, the general idea behind scientific machine learning seems to help be held correct, which is that, you know, you, you just need enough knowledge to make your predictions. And the more you can constrain your space, the better you, you can end up doing. Um, but we can't necessarily tell you like a good measure for, you know, you have this much model, so you need this much data. There's not really a concrete way of doing that. Uh, but there, in the spectrum of models, it does work out as you'd expect. Um, but you know, that, that's all, that's, uh, epidemic models and everything. You might want to see something in astrophysics. Um, a nice, a nice paper that kind of showed this in action fairly early on was, uh, was this, this paper from, from a group that looked into what happens if we presume that we know, uh, new Newtonian mechanics, right? You know, we know Newtonian mechanics, but we have a binary black hole system. And so black holes are rather big. And so you can't really just do Newtonian mechanics with them, but assume that we can, right? Assume that we can. And so you can write down the equations of, you know, new, uh, Newtonian physics in a ro rotating frame. And then you say, well, plus, uh, plus neural network, you know, plus some corrections that should be there because of general relativity, right? And what, what you can do from that is you can take a small amount of data at the beginning here. Uh, you can use that to be able to, you know, so they did this against the, the LIGO uh, gravitational wave data. And basically we were able to show that from the waveforms that you'd expect, you can train uh, the dynamics from a very small amount of data. That's the black points on the on the left part of the thing here. And then if you extrapolate forward, then you can make uh, then you can show that the the learned dynamics are able to um, are able to recreate what you'd expect uh, for just from that information, right? And so you know this is something where generally you wouldn't expect machine learning to have that good of prediction from that small amount of data. But it turns out that the relative correction relativistic corrections to the equations are not so large, right? You know, the, the relativistic, correct, correct, relativistic corrections need to be there. They, they cause a fundamentally different dynamics, but they're not a very large correction to the equations. And so therefore they're not difficult to learn from a small amount of data. And um, this is one of the projects, of course, that we're doing as, a, as, as one of the, oh, I had it open earlier. So maybe, maybe, maybe let me just uh, run it again and I'll show you at the very end that, you know, you. you this is a very quick script that you can run in like, you know, 15 minutes to recreate their results. Um, so if you want, I put, I posted the updated version of the script inside of the, inside of the Slack. Um, 
Let me, I'll get things running and then I'll just come back to it at the end. So, um, did you do? So, so yeah, uh, there, there's many different examples of, of this working in practice. I do want to kind of dive into one of them in a bit more detail. I kind of want to do more of a deep walkthrough. Um, but I will point out that I do have a YouTube video that's just like, you know, here's like 30 examples of people showing, you know, UDEs extrapolate well in every domain that you want. Because at this point, there's like hundreds of people that have done this in different areas. And so, you know, if you want to know that this thing actually kind of works, uh, you can go check out that that video that, that goes into those details. Um, yeah, so let me get this running. And in the meantime, I do want to dive into a separate script that uh, that goes into some information of what this looks like, which is actually a script that you'll go back through again with uh, with Frank later. Um, and so this this is the this is the UDE lockable terror example, right? So at the beginning, we just import libraries. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate uh, we're going to generate training data. So we take an equation that we know. We generate training data. Um, uh, we generate training data from this just by solving an ODE, right? We add some some noise to it, and we just go, okay, this is uh, this is the data that we're going to train on. And now what we do is we define U to be this neural network, right? So this is going to be a neural network that take it takes in two things and it spits out two things, and it has an RBF in there. So why an RBF? Well, you can use like any activation function; it doesn't really matter because really what we care about is is just you know some representation of a function that we don't know, right? Um, and what what you do here is then you say, okay, what what is what is this hyperbundle that I that I want to do? Well, I want to write down the equations that I know, and then I plus the the neural network terms in here, right? Um, and so we'll go into a bit with this a bit slower with Frank and uh, as you run through the example. But the key here is that once you you put this into a training loop, da da da, you train that neural network, and now what you have is you have the the version where you say, okay, the uh, the, the neural network is now trained. Um, with uh, with all the prior knowledge that I know, and one of the questions that you might not want to ask is, well, you know, I, I I get the idea of prior knowledge, but what happens if you do if you do the thing without prior knowledge, right? What if you just tried to, to learn the equations directly, right? And so in this example, it, it does go into that. So if we say, okay, let's do the symbolic regression, um, the symbolic regression da 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 is done in a few ways. But here you can see that we have the uh, doing the symbolic regression to learn the full equations. So without prior known information, we have it against the ideal data without any uh, without any noise, and then we have the the version that is uh, that is using the prior known stuff plus the neural networks, right? Um, and so the lock Volterra equations, right? We're just a we're just a quadratic equation, and you can see this is the the first version with the with the full equations, and then what it prints out is it actually gives you this representation. Saying, hey, you know the the equations that you learn are you know here, and this is actually done with uh, with uh, Pierre Cindy, which I won't I won't. It's not a fault of Cindy; it's a fault of just having you know not very much data and not much uh, uh, and and quite and some noise on it, right? And so what you can see then is that from the ideal data with no noise, it's able to find out what the what the correct terms are, um, and then the the version where you have the prior known information. Uh, it does have a spurious term in here. I think that this this is the extra spurious term, but it's able to find essentially the correct equations with plus one extra term, which is doing much better than just learning the equations purely from from data, right? And I think that the, that the, the the point there is in just another point of you know you 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 live on the spectrum of you know adding more prior knowledge is helpful um, is you know the, the the general high level, and here you can see in this example that. You know, with just some prior knowledge, just knowing that you know one of these terms is exponential increase and one of the terms is exponential decreasing, you're able to improve the way that you do the symbolic regression. Now you can poke around with different parameters, and as you change data, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different variables involved in here, but you know the robustness of the technique tends to improve as you put more prior knowledge. Um, let's see if this ran. Oh, it's still doing the waveform. Oh, actually, just found the waveform right there. And now it's going to probably put out some beautiful plots of, um, oh, nope, it's doing the, the next round. So let me, let me go back to that one. So, oh, uh, where am I in time? Uh, it's further behind than I thought. 
So one of the things that, that you know, I want to start going into some of the ex extensions beyond beyond the basics there. Um, one of the things that you can start to do is that instead of doing this with like a, a peer, um, instead of doing this with, with a peer, uh, what's the word, uh, optimization type of approach, you can all those also do this with a Bayesian approach. Um, this is from well, one of our, our papers that went to, to Laffey, um, where uh, what you do is you can just do the same training, except now you do a Bayesian uh, training of the neural network parameters, and this gives you a, a posterior distribution over the neural networks, right? So how, what's a way to interpret this? Well, posterior distribution over the neural network weights is essentially a distribution of functions that could possibly be the thing that's missing. And so we found, uh, you know, you can use that to, I mean, everyone likes to do, you know, the uncertainty cloud along your, your estimates. But I think that the most interesting use case for this kind of uncertainty cloud is to give uncertainty, uh, is to give uncertainty uh, and, and probabilities to the, um, the, predicted possible missing terms, right? So if you have a if you have a whole if instead of having a single neural network here, you have a whole distribution over potential missing functions, what you can do is you can sample this function. And each time you sample this function, you can run the symbolic regression on it. And you can then ask the question of, you know, what percentage of the time do I see a quadratic term? What percentage of the time do I see a cubic term? And then this can give you a sense of, of percentages of, you know, 10% of the time I see a cubic term, so most likely that's that's probably spurious from the symbolic regression, right? And I want to kind of put all these uh, things, a, a lot of these different pieces together. So in my next example here, what I want to do is I want to show how you can extend this, for example, to to some some sets of semi-linear PDEs, right? So, uh, so okay, what's what am I going to do here? Well, the, the property that I'm going to make use of is the fact that there's a, there's a very concrete um, uh, connection between PDE discretizations and convolution operations, right? So um, if, if you look at the, the PDE, dis if you look at, you know, for, for example, the finite difference uh, stencil that you'd use um, for the Laplacian, you know, one way to rewrite this as, is as a stencil operation, you know, 1, 1, 1, minus 4, where at every single point, you use the values around it to be able to come up with the, the value in the middle, right? So this is, this is, if you've ever done like the finite difference method for PDEs, you see that, you know, you'd write down this, you know, u, u of x minus 2, uh, you know, u of x plus delta x minus 2 of u of x plus uh, u of x minus delta x divided by delta x squared, right? You know, this is something, you can think about this instead as a stencil operation where at this point in the middle, I use one value from the left, I use one value from the right, and minus 2 from the middle, right? In two dimensions, this is I add everything on, on you know, left, right, above, below, and I subtract four from the middle, right? And that's how you approximate uh, great uh, derivatives in space for PDEs. But it turns out that if you th talk about, you know, what is a convolution layer inside of a conv convolutional neural network, it's exactly a stencil operation where, you are, where your parameters of the convolution are the coefficients of that stencil, right? So there's, there's in a direct relationship between, you know, what is a, you know, these, these convolution operations and, uh, and, you know, and the derivative approximations in space. And so you can use this to be able to say, well, let's say, let's say we wanted to learn this, this par uh, semi-linear partial differential equation. You know, it's a Fisher KPP equation, so it's a reaction diffusion equation. Well, what I can do then is I can say, well, instead of having a single neural network, right, I, I know more structure than this. I know that I have a set of reactions, and I know that I have a set, I have a set of reactions, and I have a set of, um, I have, I have a set of reactions and I have a, 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 some derivative operators, right? Well, derivative operators in the generalized sense are able to be de, uh, written as convolutions. So let's say that we have, you know, now, now what our model is going to be is this kind of generalized form of, oh, that's, the wet chalk is really weird. Um, so I, I now have a model where, where, the, where the general form is then, you know, rho sub t, right, so uh, d rho dt is, uh, you know, some conv convolution operation of uh, rho, you know, with maybe a derivative coefficient in front, uh, plus a neural network uh, with respect to rho, right? And so th this is actually a general form for, for PDEs where, the, you know, this is, this is, you know, spatial derivatives, spatial derivatives, uh, plus uh, plus uh, reaction terms, right? 
And this is actually done, you know, it looks like it's 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 maybe rather simple, but this has actually done a lot of heavy lifting for us if for for one for two specific reasons. Well, for for one reason, um, if we only make this be a single convolution operation, then we actually have you know a, a kernel here where you have a bunch of different values, you know, uh, p1, p2, dot dot dot, right? Where we you know from from a give from the given training data, we'd actually know what the value should be. It should be one 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 minus four. And you can actually impose prior information in here, right? That the that the the convolutions actually have to sum to zero. Otherwise, it's not a correct derivative, right? So th this is one piece of information that we've encoded into this model quite quite easily. Now, if you don't get that that part, I think that the other part is is actually even more interesting. Um, if you if you look at what what happens here, right? So uh, you know, if you do, for example, your your PDE discretization, you do something like uh, uh, u you know u sub one minus two u sub two plus uh, u sub 3 plus, you know, f of u sub uh, u sub 2, right? And then, you know, if, if you if you do this, this would be like u2 prime equals, you know, u3 prime equals, right? If you write down the finite difference approximation um, to what happens for so these kinds of partial differential equations, right? You, what you'd have is you'd have some spatial convolution that happens, and then you have some reaction term. But the interesting thing about this reaction term is it's local. In, so, in fact, in this in this equation, it's even going to be an R one to R one function, right? And so it's pretty amazing then that if you think about what what we've actually written down here, right? We have this we have this whole spatial grid of like you know all this data, right? You have the spatial grid, and it's evolving in time. You know, as you go through time, you have more spatial data, right? But what this is really saying is that. Well, what's going on with our chemical reactions is actually a local quantity. At every single point in time, there is just a, there is just a, you know, there is a, just a, what happens in a box. I only need to have, know what happens in this box in order to know what happens with the com with the chemical reaction. There's an Rn, there's an R1 to R1 function. And so, what is the amount of data that I have to train this R1 to R1 function? It's every single point in space. At every single point in time should all have the same exact function for how this is evolving, right? So that's a very, very, very strict structure that we've imposed here, right? By putting into the form of a reaction diffusion equation, right? In fact, what I'm saying is that in order to actually learn this function, it's just learning, you know, two or in two dimensions, nine, it's learning nine parameters in a single one-dimensional function, right? And so don't try to, don't try to think about this as a, as a, problem of learning a spatial a spatiotemporal data set it's instead just a function it's really just a problem of learning a one-dimensional a one-dimensional function in fact you don't even need a neural network for that you can use say a Fourier uh, Fourier uh, decomposition and do this rather easily so um, you know that we do this then in the with the with the Bayesian approach and we show that oh hey you know you can very easily learn what this function is you know you train the neural network in this in this generalized form you train this neural network and then you sample from the posteriors of the of the Bayesian neural network, and seventy three percent of the time it says it's just a quadratic equation, and uh, twenty seven percent of the time it says it's a cubic equation. And the original equation just had a quadratic added to the to the um, to the reaction terms, right? So, yep. Well, in the case in which the coefficients are is constant in all the domain for every time. Mm -hmm. All these uh, things work if it is constant in the space, because if not, you have to take into account the variability of fire in the space. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, you know, this is this is the whole thing of like as you as you uh, generalize your model, right? You you know, as as so this is probably the most constrained form. You can start bringing off these constraints, right? So, for example. You know, saying that this is convolution only based off of, of P means that you can't have a spatial derivative, right? So the general form of this is uh, is rho of T equals, you know, some derivative operators, you know, derivative operators of rho plus a general function of rho, right? Where this is uh, where this is local. This is what I've been encoding into this equation. But now you can say, well, what if, what if I had, you know, like a D of, you know, D of X T, you know, and uh, Laplacian row, right? Well, that that doesn't fall into this equation, so it's outside of what it would have allowed. But now I can 
you know, I can I, I could also then change this to be, you know, this is a convolution where it takes in the a neural network result of, you know, X comma T, right? Uh, comma rho, right? So, you, you, you know, this is where, you know, what, if, as you want to expand something to a larger set of equations, you just need to start making sure that you expand what you, you know, you just need to make sure that the, the equations that you believe that it falls into is allowed by the set of, of, of ways that you're doing the, the neural network modeling, right? But again, the, the same general principle is going to hold that, you know, it, the same general principle here being the idea that, you know, the more constrained you make your model, the less data you can do this with, right? Um, so yeah, you, you can generalize this, you can generalize this. You can even do this with a, just a neural network, right? But if you do this with just a neural network, you're going to need more training data to get this the same accuracy than the version that's a bit more constrained. Right. Um, and so, you know, kind of going along these lines, you know, you might start thinking of what are other ways I can come up with, with uh, structure that is useful, right? Um, this, this is one of the ones from the, from the Sandia paper. Um, that, that's kind of interesting. So in this case, what, what we're doing to encode structure is we're saying, well, I don't actually know any of the equations, but I know how things interact, right? You know, so here, this is, this is going back to epidemic models because they're just nice and simple. You know, here I say I have, you know, susceptible individuals, they become infected, um, and infected individuals, either they recover or they die, right? But you, you, this interaction here, you know, do, do you go from susceptible to recovered? No, that doesn't happen. You also don't go from just susceptible to dead. Maybe you actually can because there's other ways to die than COVID-19. But in a, in a quick approximation, no, there isn't, right? So can we encode this structure that, you know, S goes to I, I goes to R, and I goes to D? Can we encode that and come up with a, a machine learning framework that has just this kind of information that we have, right? And this is what we come up with. So we say, okay, you know, each, each neural network in here is a universal approximator, right? They can approximate functions. So, um, you know, under the assumption, though, no, you know, we're going to take our neural network. When, when I say neural network in this case, I mean, it's some neural network that we absolute value. So that way they're all, it's approximating positive functions, right? Um, but here what we have is, you know, DSDT is minus N, the first neural network. And then that first neural network shows up in the I equation. And then you minus the second neural network minus the third neural network, and that shows up in the thir uh, second third, right? Which means what we really have here is we have neural networks that represent the different rates of transitions, um, right? But we're we're basically saying I know that I know that these are the transitions that are allowed, these are the transitions that are not allowed, and also with this information, one of the nice things that you have from this model is you also have conservation of individuals, right? You know, any decrease in S is an increase in I, any decrease in I is an increase in either R or D. So here is a model that both has conservation of S plus I plus R plus D and only allows the interactions that we believe are true. Now please find out the equations. And you can use you can do the same thing where you train these neural networks um, within the context of the simulator. And then you perform the sparse regression on the different terms uh, in individually, and you see that you can recover the equations with uh, pretty nicely. Um, and then the, the main thing here is that you can recover the equations using this information with less data than is required to do the full recovery, right? And why is that the case? Well, because we've we've constrained, essentially con built a universal approximator that has some certain properties that we know to be true, and therefore it ends up being a bit more data efficient, right? It's the same story over and over and over, just different examples of this coming to life. Um, so here is another example with a, this is now with a reaction uh, reaction diffusion infection equation. I think that I've heard some people talking about chemical reaction equations, which are somewhat similar to this one. Um, so uh, in this case, we have a, a reaction diffusion infection equation where we actually know a lot of the 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 flow properties of, of, the, um, of the chemical reaction or of the, of, the, of the chemicals, but we don't know as a chemical reaction uh, itself, right? And as I mentioned, the chemical reaction is actually one of the easy things. It's a local function that is repeated over and over and over at every point in space. So here, this is an R2 to R2 function, um, which, you know, and then we just train this R2 to R2 function on that small amount of training data. And now if you, if you were to actually try to do this with something like a, C, uh, like a CNN or something, it would never extrapolate, like, you know, correctly like that. But you can see if you, if you look really closely, there's a little squares of the observations. Those are real, uh, that's some, some data. And then the, 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 the dashes go through it, right? What this is really showing is that 
you know, it didn't take very much data to be able to learn what the chemical reactions are. And once we've learned the correct chemical reactions, we can make the predictions. But the reason why it doesn't take very much data to be able to learn this is because we're learning a very, very small function in the relative scheme of all the data that we have. It's just two values come in, two values go out, but we have those two values at every single point in space and time. And so even though it looks like a small amount of data in the time series sense, it's actually a rather large amount of data when you look at the spatial temporal data that's used to train it. Now, one of the interesting cases here, okay, let's go back to the symbolic regression, and what does the symbolic regression tell us here? This one I actually found to be a very interesting case for the, the model discovery and symbolic regression part. So uh, when, we, when we look at the symbolic regression here, um, we noticed that the, the, you know, here, here we were able to do this uh, both with, with the data, but also we can also generate data, right? And so where we know exactly the functions. Um, and with the case with, with generated data, you can actually see that the symbolic regression doesn't always get the, the exact equations, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes it gets something that is of a very similar form and you're like, great, it's hit it spot on. But other times there are, there are a few of them that just looked wrong, right? But then when we investigated it further, something that was fairly interesting was that if we took the Taylor series approximation, you know, the first two terms of a Taylor series uh, for the true kinetic, for the true, or like for the, so this is for the reactions that it's learned, right? When we take the Taylor series approximation for the true uh, data generating process and for the learned ones, what we see is that they line up pretty spot on, right? And what this is telling us is that, you know, the symbolic regression is, is kind of working in a space that is kind of ill-constrained. And this is why I say, you know, you can kind of take your symbolic regression results with somewhat of a grain of salt. It's going to give you a simple model that explains the curve that it's supposed to be explaining, but it's not necessarily unique what that curve is, or how to express that curve is not necessarily unique. But what we have found is that it's going to capture certain properties correctly. You know, it's going to be like the correct shape, as we can t talk about concretely through Oh, is second order Taylor series expansions are fairly close in, in, in four, right? So, you know, well, I, I think that the, the, the takeaway from that is that, you know, the thing to get from the, the, from the symbolic regression is, uh, you know, this process, you know, all these different processes, they work to give you something in a model that is in the right direction, though it might not be giving you something that's exactly the right way to write down the, the physics that you have there. So what it will be able to tell you, though, is it'll be able to say, you know, these are the chemicals that are reacting or these chemical, you know, in some cases the chemicals are interacting, in some cases they're not interacting. It's gotten that correct in each of the cases, right? Whether they're reacting, interacting, or not interacting. And so it's telling you something about the model, but it's not necessarily telling you everything about the exact equation form, right? And and so that's something to keep in mind that, you know, I, I would think about this as more of like a scientist in the loop kind of process. You can use this to be able to help you come up with what the correct model is, but don't always just assume that symbolic regression is going to give you the exact right model just because it fits really well and makes the right predictions, right? You can, you can have something that predicts extremely correctly, but it does not mean it's actually the right model. Um, so what are some other things that you can do? Well, one of, the, one of the other things that you can do is you can use what's known as a differential algebraic equation. So here, for example, is a chemical kinetics equation where... Um, you have uh, Y1, Y2, and Y3, but you have that the evolution of Y3 is actually constrained by the fact that Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 always sums to one, right? This is another way of, you know, of writing down one of these kinds of equations where you say, well, I have a bunch of things going on, but I, I actually know some conservation laws. And what you can use it, do is you can actually write down a differential algebraic equation, uh, which is a ODE with a uh, singular mass matrix, right? You can write this down and you can do the same trick where you then say, okay, I don't know part of the model. Let's do this with a neural network. And the neural network can then learn under the constraint that you have to ha satisfy this conservation law. So this is a nice way to then be able to encode arbitrary conservation laws into these function approximators, right? And in, in fact, a, a nice general form for, for, you know, so like general, general uh, uh, conservation law Is the form, uh, you know, uh, is the form uh, u prime equals uh, u prime equals neural network of u and uh, v and uh, v uh, equals or zero equals uh, g of u v, which actually can be represented as you know this is actually equivalent in form to m of m u prime equals neural network of you, right? So this is the version without structure. 
And if you write down, a, you can basically say, oh, I have a differential equation where I have conservation laws, these things that have to be satisfied exactly at every single step. You can actually write these down by using a mass matrix times u, uh, where the mass matrix is singular, um, uh, uh, equals the neural network. And now you can use this to be able to say, to impose any conservation that you need. Um, as you go to DAEs, the, the numerics get more intense, but the, the modeling is, is rather straightforward. Um, one fun way that we actually made use of this, uh, just to kind of point out some, some fun things, is uh, as part of uh, what we do with Julia Hub, we worked with the Williams Formula One racing team, and we, and we created a model that was uh, using the speed over ground sensor data. You know, so it, they drive on this test track we're using uh, with this ground, speed over ground sensor, and it informs the, uh, the, 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 the drivers as to what the orientation of the car is, right? So they drive this around the track um, on, on a test track where they know all the information, and what you want to be able to do is from that sensor data, be able to know and predict what is the angle of the car with respect to some global north, right, at any time. The reason why this is interesting is because on the trackside computer, if you ever watch the Formula One race, they have someone on the on the call that basically says, oh, you know, you took this last turn at 42 degrees. It should, the optimal turn would have been at 40 degrees, right? And how they actually have to come up with, the, with, the, with that is use this speed over ground sensor data, right? And so um, the, the, we worked with the, with the Williams Formula One team uh, to be able to come up with a new model that was able to be much better predicted than the previous one, uh, where the, the, the actual speed over ground uh, orientation is, uh, is what's colored in the background there in both cases. The, the movements of the car is the prediction from the model um, uh, for, uh, from, the, from the sensor data of what the current orientation is. And you can see that the uh, original model, which is a Gaussian process, it has a lot of these properties that are non-physical, right? Um, and so was you know it's doing a direct uh, it's doing a direct kind of Gaussian process neural network kind of thing, just directly from the sensor data to predict the orientation. And there's just some areas where it, well, it has non-physical behavior. That's the best way to describe it, right? But in what what we what we said you know it's predicting instead what we're saying is okay, this is pre predicting some forces and then the, these forces and you actually have a model of the car where you say we integrate these forces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so from exactly the same amount of data, we're able to come up with something that predicts a lot better, but also predicts a lot more physically, right? The car cannot do this kind of movement where it's jiggling like that. And so you can see that one of the things, basically what we said is physically, this is what's allowable from this data, find out what the orientation of the car is. And so this is, uh, this is then what we're able to, uh, uh, in, you know, we were able to get some pretty nice improvements to the predictions just by imposing some very basic physical constraints as to how the car must be moving, right? Um, so, so that's one nice way it's actually being used in practice. And you know, good luck on the on the uh, Vegas race. Um, I, I I think that uh, one of the uh, another kind of example that's kind of nice in this scheme. Uh, I'm not going to go into this too much. Uh, I can share with you a poster that one of my students put together. Um, Basically, you can put neural networks in such a way so that way the only possible uh, predictions are things that satisfy mass action kinetics. This is what we have as a chemical reaction neural network. And so, you know, if you, again, if you impose a neural network in such a form, which I'm not going to describe here in detail, but if you, you basically have a neural network where for no matter what weights of the, uh, of the neural network you have, it gives you different forms of, of, of mass action kinetics. And so, the, you know, this ends up being a universal approximator over valid conservation, uh, val or valid uh, chemical reaction uh, equations, right? And so for any, any parameters that you have, you have a mass action kinetic model. And what we show is that this ends up being a fairly nice way to be able to uh, learn uh, these uh, reaction rates and such, and it predicts much better than naive approaches like LSTMs because it's constrained to the properties uh, that have to be true for chemical reactions, right? It's just another, all of these are really just different um, are just different examples of this one same idea that I want to show again, which is that, you know, again, if you use some prior information about what you know has to be going on, you know, like in your in your chemical reaction, in a course on chemical reactions, you go, oh, th things follow mass action kinetics, right? In a course on general relativity, you know, like, oh, the relativistic equations are pretty much true, right? Like if you if you use a bit of that information, then the amount of data that's required is generally less, right? And there's just tons and tons and tons of different results that reinforce this point. Um, so let me, in the last, you know, 15 minutes here, I want to kind of go into some some cool stuff, right? So, well, first of all, I just want to mention that, um, you know, the first thing is, I, I still haven't told you about how any of these neural networks are, are trained. That's because uh, we've, we've talked about it in different parts here, but I just want to reiterate that um, 
I just want to reiterate that what you do is you, you put this, this equation with the neural network into a loss function, and then you just do gradient descent, uh, which means you generally have to differentiate the, the simulation process that has the neural network in there, right? So, but this was already talked about in other talks, so I'm going to skip over this a bit. But essentially, taking derivatives of solvers with neural networks in there is how you, you do all this different training. Um, let me... I let me make, uh, go through, uh, you, I guess I'll, I'll go through these, these two stories, right? So can you generalize uh, differential simulation and, the, and these kinds of techniques beyond continuous models, right? Because everything I showed here so far was ODEs and PDEs. Um, you know, what are, what are some uh, more difficult things? Well, the, the first more difficult thing is still an ODE, but um, it's, a, chemo it's a, a chaotic equation, right? And one of the interesting things about a chaotic equation is that you do not necessarily have good trajectory information. Um, now, there, there's a few different ways to describe this. One way of describing this is that your errors grow exponentially fast. Um, but another way of describing that is that uh, automatic differentiation actually gives you infinites if you run it long enough. Uh, the reason is because the error in your automatic differentiation, it grows exponentially with respect to your Lyapunov coefficient. That's another definition of the Lyapunov coefficient because the derivative calculation is the, the uh, tangent space part of it. Um, so so if, you, if you want to start doing this on, on chaotic models, right, all this, all this type of stuff, it kind of starts to fall apart because the, the uh, idea of how you train, how you calculate your derivatives starts to um, be more ill-defined. But what, what you can do is you can come up with different ways to calculate derivatives with respect to ergodic quantities, right? So, so you know, the, you know, x is not well-defined or x of t is not well defined um, for like Lorenz equation, right? If you if you if you solve uh, the ODE with uh, with a numerical solver, you're going to get something that lives on the attractor and gives you a nice pretty picture, but it's not necessarily the correct x of t. And this is something you you can you can prove. Uh, pretty much no numerical method will be correct. It'll give you correct pictures because of something called uh, the the shadow um, le shadowing lemma, right? But what you what is something that is uh, correct is statistics, right? So you know you have these ergodic theorems. And I'm not going to explain the whole ergodic theorem, but what you can, what you can show is that you know for for a lot of cha chaotic systems, you have these properties like you know uh, the average of x, the average of y, the average of z. These are well-defined things, and your numerical solver will be able to calculate these correctly. And so what we can start to do is you can say, well, I can't do, you know, training on time series data, but what I can do here is I can do training against data of statistical information, and I can start taking, you know, the derivative with respect to statistical information for my different parameters, and I can use that to be able to do my fitting. So I write my loss function in terms of statistical information, and this is something that, uh, this is something that I've actually proposed as a nice project for folks here who are interested in, in some of this, uh, you know, n-body models and such. What we can show is that you can use this to be able to learn the parameters of a of a Lorentz equation from data that is spaced out, right? So the data is too spaced out to get a good derivative approximation, but you can still get a be able to do parameter estimation. One of the things that we have not been able to do in full, though, is directly learn uh, a neural network approximation. Um, you know, do all the UDE stuff with uh, with just statistical information. We haven't been able to get that to work in complete, but I'm looking for a student who's interested in working on that type of problem. So that's an open call to whoever is interested in this topic. Um, if you want to just chat with me, um, I think as a last topic here, you know, I want to kind of go into, well, I guess this is the second to last topic, maybe for time. Um, I want to mention that, you know, so one case where you have a, a breakdown of, of the process is with uh, chaos. Another play, um, and if you want to go into a lot more detail, I think this is like better as like a, you know, dinner topic uh, to go into detail. Um, I think that the other one is uh, ha handling uh, discrete randomness, right? Um, so you might have a you might have a model that's like a, you know, you know, uh, uh, flip a coin. So you know, so you have a Bernoulli, uh, Bernoulli with uh, row, right? Which or, or with p, right? Which is a uh, you know, flip a coin with uh, probability p of being heads, right? So what this means is that if, if x, uh, x of p 
um, is going to be something that's either equal to zero or one any given time, right? So what we want to do is we then want to learn we want to learn p from a set of data, and you know the you know, you you kind of know in the simple case like oh it's just the the average number of of heads divided by the or, you know it's the number of heads divided by the total number of flips, right? But how can we do this automatically with the computer is kind of the, the, the question, right? So let's say you have a whole stochastic simulation that takes in some parameters and spits out uh, that spits out data. Can you do UDE-like things here, even if your values are completely non-differentiable? They're in the space of zeros and ones, right? Um, and the way and the way to kind of do uh, think about this is uh, is to generalize the way that we do the 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 training process. So um, so uh, let's see. So, so what we do is, we, so if you, if you look at what automatic differentiation does, automatic differentiation, right? We, we talked about this in the, in the seminar room yesterday. It's essentially, uh, you know, take, take in a deterministic program and what it does is it then spits out, spit out deterministic program deterministic program with with uh, two outputs with two outputs um, which is uh, the value and the derivative right so the way that we do the training process this automatic differentiation process and everything Right. What you do, what you would have done is you would have taken you would have given it a simulator that has neural networks and everything in there, and when you do perform automatic differentiation, it generates a new code that has that both outputs the output of your simulation and the derivative of your simulation with respect to parameters. Right. Now, if we want to generalize this kind of UDE scientific machine learning to cases where uh, where where this might not be as well defined, for example, learning how coin flips work. Right. What we want to do is we want to generalize to something called stochastic AD, stochastic AD, where you take in a stochastic program, and what you do is you then have it spit out a uh, spit out a stochastic program such that um, such that the the it gives two outputs or two outputs and the second satisfies the expectation of that output x tilde uh, is equal to the derivative of the expectation of the original program with respect to parameters right so what i mean is like you know so you you have a program that, that flips coins and what I want to do is I want to create a new program that it first flips a coin, it sees what the coin flip does, flips a second coin, and then it has now a second value, where what happens is that the first value is just the same coin flip kind of process. It's that has the same distribution output. But the second process is defined in a very specific way, such that the average of its output is actually the derivative of the average of the original program's output. Um, and I'm not going to... You know, I'm, I'm keeping away from a lot of the math in this in this talk, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a way to do this actually completely automatically, um, where it then just takes in a, a piece of code that has coin flips and binomials and and Poisson distributions and such, and is able to spit out something that can that can accurately predict what the what the expected values are and and its derivatives, right? Um, in, in a nice and general way. And what this mean and what we've been able to show then is that. You know, so let's say uh, for so th this example, it's using a stochastic game of life. So if you know like Conway's game of life from like Computer Science 101, that's deterministic. But now we say, okay, you know, given given these this configuration, there's now a, a probability that you have things turn flip on and off, right? Those probabilities can be parameters. And what we can do is you can say, well, if we want the stochastic game of life to uh, to be acting in a certain way, we can take the derivative with respect to those parameters and actually learn that. And then we can start to say, well, if we want to some, if we want to actually learn some very complex behavior, instead of just having, uh, instead of just fixing the the Conway's game of life rules in specific to specific numbers, I can make there be neural networks inside of Conway's game of life, that, and then I can train these neural networks to force it 
into the right direction that I want. And so this this general is that what this uh, allows you to do then is kind of generalize the whole UDE type of, of space to now where you can say, well, you can do the same thing with agent based models, and you can do things the same things with uh, you know stochastic particle scattering models and all these kinds of things, right? Uh, every everything that basically as long as you can calculate derivatives of your simulator in some way then you can put neural networks into that simulator and train those neural networks to be able to, to give you the right behaviors. And so in some general sense, then you can start to think about the scientific machine learning as it's just a process of using simulators that are approximately correct and mixing them with the, with the machine learning training process. And then, well, why do you want to use the, the simulator? Well, because the simulators are best known in, in some sense, once you start to get to very advanced physics and a very advanced biology or whatever domain you're in, a lot of times, the best known description of what's going on is a simulation process itself, and you can just start to use that as your as your source of truth. Um, I think that you know, with the five minutes or so, four minutes or so, I think I might cut it there before I go into a next topic. Um, yeah, I mean, the next topic would have just been, you know, uh, why not use physics-informed neural networks? If you do, if you do all this correctly, you tend to outperform physics-informed neural networks by like ten thousand times or something. Um, but that we could go, we could go into to details there. I think that the big general point is, you know, instead of just doing machine learning on its own, use every null piece of knowledge that you have, whether it's just a weird simulator or high level differential equation, et cetera, et cetera. Use all that knowledge that you have, constrain the neural networks to very specific forms to be able to encode even more knowledge. And if you do all this, then the amount of data that's required to get a very good prediction is much decreased from the standard, you know, simplest uh, machine learning form. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Everybody's looking for lunch. Oh, yeah, there. Uh, you want to shout? Or... Um, I was surprised about your statement that learning an um, chaotic system is difficult or impossible in the learning. I would argue that if you extend your equation a little bit and allow for a little bit of stochastic noise on the right-hand side and do the inference then, the things get robust. Because then you have the trade-off, oh, the parameter is like this because um, the set in a certain way, or there was a trade-off, and and uh, in the inference, things are much more localized in time. Yet, uh, I will add you that it's ancient work. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll I'll put a big you know it depends on there. Um, so so first of all, I I do want to just kind of show one quick bit that I forgot at the end here. So then I got the 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 code running again. You can see the you know this is uh. The, the orange or the, the green is the Newtonian mechanics. And then you, when you extend it, it's able to match the waveform as well. And, you know, if you want this example code and you actually see this in action, you know, you can run it on your computer. One thing that has never been done on this example is the symbolic regression. So it'd be fun to see what happens. If you symbolic regress this and you compare it to the, you know, the, the first and second order terms of the relativistic correction. No idea if it's going to work or not, but it's a fun, fun, fun pro uh, project to do. But going, going back to this, yeah, with the, with, with, with the chaotic systems, um, it's a gigantic. It depends, right? And 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 the reason why is is, is this, right? So, um, you know, as you do the uh, as you do like the Lorentz equations, right? You know, you go through the Lorentz equations here, right? The, the the big question is going to be, how far apart have you sampled your data, right? If you've sampled your data close enough, right, you might be able to follow one trajectory. Or I guess I'm not following a trajectory there, but. Uh, Right. If you if you follow one trajectory and your and your data points are close enough, right? What you can do is you can build derivative estimates from there, right? And if you have the derivative estimates from there, then you can be like, okay, u prime u u prime equals s. You don't need to you don't need to have the chaotic simulator involved. You can just try to check whether you're you're you know you can build a matrix of u here, do this against a matrix of of f values, right? And then just do the symbolic regression here, right? Which is this is something that that Cindy Cindy actually does. Um, which uh, which does work in the case, but in, in a specific case, right? The specific case has to be that your data has to be dense enough that you get uh, good enough derivative approximations. So if you instead had, you know, one data point here and then it moves around a few butterfly wings, right? And you have a data point here 
you move it around a few butterfly wings, you have your data here. Well, no local derivative estimate, no spline is going to work on that, right? And so this is this is really the case that that we were looking at here, where we say, okay, if you have data points that are spread out by more than a Lyapunov time, you know, then really you 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 know any solver between between those points is going to have O of one error because of all the chaotic uh, issues. And so therefore, what can you do to actually learn in this case? And that then requires some some difficulties. And so I think yeah, the, that's the big giant. It depends on the kind of data that you have. Uh, other data can fix this. Other data can can break that. And as you mentioned, sometimes if you will add stochasticity, right? So if you make this in a stochastic differential equation, in some cases you actually have a non-chaotic equation because it's only chaotic on a. On, in some cases, it's only chaotic on the low-dimensional manifold. So once you perturb off of that manifold, it ends up having nicer dynamics. In other cases, it's actually not. Uh, it also can have stochastic di uh, chaos as well. And so there's a lot of gigantic. It depends in 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 the statement that uh, chaos is hard. But when, so when I when I was talking about chaos is hard, what I really meant there is chaos is hard for calculating derivatives of simulators. If you just try to do the naive approach where you just say, oh, you know, I have a simulator of the Lorentz equation, I stick a neural network in there, I calculate a derivative, and I do all the fitting, you see that that all breaks down. That that process completely breaks down because the derivatives and the, well, the solution is not well defined in the classical sense and so, uh, from the numerical problem, and so then the derivatives end up having issues. So. Yeah, this is also why I said that, you know, this could be a very nice uh, dinner topic because uh, we can talk about details on that forever as well. Was that a sufficient answer or? Well, did it. And I did a fully did it. It's too sparse or it's time to bait and sparse is a new point of time. Oh, wait. I'm going to mute in the But I would still argue if you have fine time resolved. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you, if you have fine time data, then you can yeah. do a co-location approach. That certainly makes for a good yeah. lunch uh, discussion for you guys. Is there another quick question? Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, in the example where you, <clears throat> sorry, where you um, showed how to include derivatives, uh, you know, the special derivative down there, mm -hmm. um, this is going to be a very naive question. Um, does it mean that then I force my uh, my system to have a derivative, or is, is there a way where I can say, okay, I, I I put there a few terms, and then the system will tell me which one is important? Yeah. Well, I mean, so 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 one of the one of the things that's kind of mentioned here, right? So okay, in this form, I say that th I I have a deri I have a, co a one coefficient, I have a convolution operator, and then I have a neural network, right? And then the convolution operator just has these. Uh, you know, just has four, uh, five parameters, right? Um, the convolution operator has has nine has nine parameters, right? And so uh, I did mention that there's another piece that we put on there. Kind of look through the details of the UD paper if you want all the details. One of the other things that we impose is that the the sum over the piece of i is equal to zero, right? Because in, for any derivative operator, you actually have to have that as conservative. Um, so actually, one valid solution of this is all these p are equal to zero. So therefore, there's uh, there's no spatial uh, diffusion or advection. Yeah. Cool. Then uh, the rest of the questions you can ask Chris uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and we, I don't know, do we go into more details of any of that stuff during the tutorial tomorrow? I don't. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think in the, in the tutorial he'll actually go through the the Lock Voltaire example and actually run it piece by piece and explain each part of the code. So, you know, I was just painting the full picture. Now we'll dive back into the details. Beautiful. Then uh, I leave you uh, for lunch. Uh, let's thank Chris again. <laughs>